Welcome back to Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, an attorney licensed in both New York and Florida, and this is the recap of Trial Day 8 in the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed case. Grab your red solo cup, pour yourself a drink, and let's recap. Today we heard from more civilian witnesses. First up was Chris Albert, who knew John O'Keefe because they lived on the same street. So they were neighbors who at one point had a little hiccup due to Chris's young son, but in the end, the relationship between the two men was amicable, so much so that on the 28th, that Friday night, John and his nephew went into Chris Albert's pizza shop for some pizza, and Chris suggested that they hang out later that night. And that's exactly what happened. After Chris closed up his shop, he headed over to Waterfall, where he was meeting a group of friends, and he texted John to join him there. John was at McCarthy's, but he and Karen Reed, the defendant, ultimately left there and headed to Waterfall, arriving about 10.45 p.m. Now, between you and me these days, just being out of the house at 10.45 p.m. sounds like a terrible idea. No, thank you. I'd much prefer to be home no later than nine. Or better yet, how about we just cancel plans and we can pretend that we'll rain check for some other time. <laughs> This coming from a girl who in college would be napping at 1045 in preparation for going out by midnight and partying all night. But those days are well behind me. Back to the trial. So Chris educated us a little bit about his family tree. There are seven siblings in total, including Brian, the former Boston cop, and Kevin, the Canton cop. Defense counsel made it a point to tie not only Chris, but the other Albert family members to other people in the community who have some power or influence. So we learned that Chris became a selectman. He sat on a board of five other selectmen, and its duty was to oversee public safety, including the police department in Canton. We also learned that Kevin, one of the brothers, was a police detective who served under Chief Berkowitz in the Canton Police Department. Chris refers to Chief Berkowitz as Kenny. Chris and Kenny were friendly, and Kenny supported Chris's campaign to become a selectman. Brian, another brother, also knew Chief Berkowitz and even attended the chief's retirement party. Chris also grew up and was friends with Sergeant Michael Lank. Remember, he's the officer that testified two two days ago, I think it was, he testified that he took the initial witness statements at 34 Fairview after John was found. This despite the fact that interviewing those individuals in that group, in the group setting that it was, could have been seen as a conflict of interest. So Chris knew and was friends, or at least friendly with a lot of Canton cops with whom he socialized and drank with on occasion. Now, extending out his circle, Chris also knew Massachusetts state trooper, Michael Proctor. One of Chris's wife's best friends is Proctor's sister named Courtney. And we'll get into more of that relationship when Chris's wife testifies after he finishes. They've known Proctor for about 15 years and have socialized with each other. Their families are close. So the defense made all those connections, hoping to prove that perhaps Chris and or the other Albert family members through their position and their relationship with others in authority had some pull, some influence in the police investigation. I saw all the connections and I acknowledge them, but I'm not entirely convinced at the moment that those relationships impacted the investigation. So time and additional evidence will tell. So Chris went on to describe the night of the 28th, how the entire friend group gathered at Waterfalls, how John and Karen met up with them there. He testified that he didn't observe Karen being intoxicated at all. She seemed just fine and, you know, with all her faculties. He noted that when she arrived at Waterfalls, she pulled a, a clear glass with a clear liquid from her jacket, which he thought was strange. But other than that, the couple appeared all right no arguing or anything like that. Waterfalls was closing and we saw footage of Chris leaving at 12, 13 a.m. The defense got into the timing of the next half an hour quite a bit, but it boiled down to Chris walked straight home when he left Waterfalls. He got home about 12, 19 and he went directly to bed after taking off his clothes. He fell asleep around 12, 35. 
About 10 minutes later, his 17-year-old son, Colin, came home and he testified that Colin popped his head into their bedroom, waking him up just to say goodnight. Colin had been at 34 Fairview that night celebrating his cousin's birthday. The next morning, Chris woke up about 8 a.m. And while he was still in bed, his wife told him that John was found at 34 Fairview a bit earlier and he was dead. Chris said he was in shock, but he got up and went to Fairview. When he got there, Brian and Nicole Albert were there, as well as the McCabe's and Brian Higgins. A few days later, he testified his friend Proctor from the state police and another officer reached out to Chris for an interview. There wasn't much testimony about the extent of the interview, only that apparently Proctor introduced himself to Chris like they didn't know each other. And Chris doesn't remember if he told Proctor that his son, Colin, had been at 34 Fairview the night before. The next witness was Julie Albert, the wife of Chris Albert. Her direct testimony was kind of bland and didn't offer much in terms of critical information as it pertains to the case. So she talked about her evening, how she came to be at the waterfall with the people she was with, how she ended up leaving early because she had a migraine. Before she left, she testified that when Karen and John arrived at Waterfalls, Karen brought a drink out of her jacket and that she thought it was funny. Because she wasn't feeling well, she headed home early and got into bed, although she didn't fall asleep. That's because not only was her husband still out at Waterfalls, but more importantly, her middle son, Colin, was not home yet. She was under the impression that he had gone to a friend's house that night and later ended up at 34 Fairview to celebrate his cousin's birthday, and that would be Brian Albert Jr. So she was waiting for her son to get home before she fell asleep. Shortly after midnight, her husband came home, took off his clothes, and without washing up, jumped into bed. Now, pause. I don't know about you, but I happen to be a bit anal about washing up. I'm of the opinion that everybody should wash the day off of them before getting into bed. Who wants to sleep in their own filth? And even more importantly, at the very least, wash your hands and your face before you go to bed. That's a personal preference, but I'm pretty sure it's basic hygiene. Back to the trial. So Chris jumps into bed and 10, 15 minutes later, their son Colin gets home. He popped his head in the room and she testified that she and Colin had a little conversation. Remember, Chris had said that Colin popped his head in just to say goodnight and then he left. But Julie made it seem like Colin lingered longer than that. Regardless, she didn't notice anything unusual about Colin, like any injuries on him or weird behavior. The next morning was her nephew, Brian Albert Jr.'s birthday. So we heard about her tradition of dropping off Dunkin' Donuts for him the first thing on the morning of his birthday every year. And this year, it was nothing dif- It was nothing different. This year was no different. Before she got out of bed, she, she did notice that she had one missed call from her best friend, Jen McCabe, from 5.55 a.m. There was no text message or voicemail left, just, just the missed call. The witness didn't do anything about it. She didn't call her back or text her to find out what was up. But the witness made her way to Dunkin' Donuts for the donuts, then went to the Albert house to drop them off. She said she got there around 8.30 or 9. She noticed that Jen McCabe's car was in the driveway, but she didn't recall anything else strange. She got out of her car and went to go put the donuts and the birthday card in Brian Jr.'s car. While she was doing that, Brian Albert Sr. came to the door and told her to come inside. She said, no, 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 I'm just dropping the donuts off for Brian Albert Jr. But Brian Brian Albert Sr., he insisted that she come inside. So she made her way inside. Now, pause. Am I the only one who thinks it's strange that the witness got a phone call from her best friend in the middle of the night while there's a blizzard, and now she sees her best friend's car 
at her brother-in-law's house and the brother-in-law is insisting that she come inside, but she initially was like, nah, no. Wouldn't you be wondering what's going on here? I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm looking too much into it. Back to the testimony. So Julie walked inside the house and sees the Alberts, the McCabe's, and Brian Higgins all sitting at the kitchen table, looking visibly upset. She says she walked in and she was like, what's going on here? And after an extended pause, Jen McCabe said, something happened to John. The witness asked if he was okay. And Jen said, we don't know. So after hearing the news, she left 34 Fairview, went home to wake up Chris. And Chris said that he was already awake, but we don't know. Anyway, she said that she went to wake up Chris and she told Chris that something had happened to John and come on, let's go back to the Albert house. So that's what they did. Those were the events as she recounted them for that morning, January 29th. After she recounted those events, we got into her relationship with Trooper Michael Proctor's sister named Courtney. Both Julie and Julie's sister are very close friends with Courtney. Julie provided childcare for Courtney's two children twice a week for about a year before COVID, and then occasionally as needed after 2019. It's possible, though not confirmed through testimony because there was a sustained objection that Courtney even recommended the witness to her brother, Michael Proctor, to watch his kids. So that bell can't be unrung and there's a possibility that happened. But it's clear that the families are close. The witness testified that she and her kids spent time at the Proctor family pool many times with the Proctor parents. The kids spend time together. And through more objections that were sustained, we heard that the witness was at Courtney's wedding and her son was a ring bearer for Courtney. Now the defense next got into the frequency of communication between the witness and Courtney Proctor. The witness testified that they quote, rarely spoke on the phone and they mostly texted each other. And I was like, okay, I get it. I don't often speak on the phone with my best friends either. Most of our communication is by texting or face to face. But then the defense brought out the phone records and asked the witness about the 67 phone calls that she and Courtney had in a six month time span. Honestly, I don't even think I've made 67 phone calls this year yet, and we're already in May. So the defense pressed the witness about certain calls and pointed out the call that just so happened to occur the day that Karen was arrested. The three calls on the day Karen was arraigned before the arraignment and another call after the arraignment that was nearly 30 minutes long. The defense then asked whether she used Courtney Proctor as an intermediary to communicate with her brother, Trooper Proctor. The witness denied that occurring. But the question reminded me that in the opening statements, we heard about Trooper Proctor being very loose-lipped about the status of the death investigation, right? Including keeping Kev Kevin Albert, who has nothing to do with the Massachusetts State Police, up to date on where things were and texting his friend group about the case. So it's not completely out of the realm of possibility what the defense had asked the witness about. Of course, we haven't heard sworn testimony about Trooper Proctor and his practices regarding the confidentiality of the investigation, but I'm just thinking ahead and putting pieces together. So that wrapped up day eight of the trial. We'll see Julie Albert back on the stand for more cross-examination tomorrow morning. I hope you'll join me again tomorrow or soon thereafter for my recap of day nine. Thanks for being with me today. Until the next drop, peace.